You're listening to Footy Talk, your place where you get all the news, interviews and analysis from the world of AFL. And as we do every Tuesday, we try and set the agenda and analyse the big topics of the week with this man, Nick Rewalt, over there in the States. Good to see you again, Rui, in that beautiful, nice blue little collared T-shirt of yours. How, how are you travelling? Good. Yeah, good, Joey. Uh, I- interested in your weekend, mate. How many, how many bottles of red? How many bottles of Barossa red for you? Yeah, I had a couple. I uh, got over there Wednesday, um, so I spent about Oof, four or early. five days. It was early. We had to get over there for 360. So Wednesday <laughs> probably got out of hand because we watched the celebrity yeah. boxing. A few of us got together yeah. to go and watch a few of the fights, and then everyone gets a bit excited and carried away and bumped into a few people, and that was a large one, and then just made it a bit difficult for the rest of the week to get my work done. But uh, found, the, found the right balance, I think. I was impressed with the boxing. I got to say, like Nathan Brown looked, it, it like looked good. the corn. Kane looked unbelievable when he got up uh, for the the pre-fight. Um, his rig was phenomenal, but Brownie looked good. And then Mitch Robertson, Mitch Robertson, oh like everyone thought, Kane Pettifer, who's had three professional yeah, well, fights, was going to win. But yeah. Mitch Robertson was very, very good. He punched holes in him. It was yep. unbelievable. Um, yep. what, what what are the uh, what are the chances of you doing something like that? Nah, no chance of that, Root. No chance Zero. of that. Yeah, you do know I'm playing a game of footy do, later this I year. I heard that. The I heard draft. that. Well, we you, like do it, love we you. Like... you do love your ca- you do love your cash, Joey, so Mate, no, got, no surprise there. I've got three young kids. I have to pay the bills, but we'll get into that <laughs> another time. Hey, we wanted to get straight into uh, the footy action. Gather round was a big success. We won't bang on about it too much. I think the, uh, the fans are sick of all the media talking up about how good it was. So let's get into your thought of the week to kick us off. Yeah, well, this has been a few weeks building now, really. Like, what are we, four or five weeks into the season? And, and I think if there was ever an argument for how difficult it is to be a forward versus a midfielder, we can finally put it to bed. And the case in point is Isaac Heaney. I, I feel like every year we have a discussion around Isaac Heaney. I know he's been an All-Australian about... Gee, when is this guy really just going to get over that hump and become a superstar of the competition? Well, all it took was him to become a midfielder, to become a proper bona fide every week superstar of the competition. And it just, for me, it really begs the question. Guys like Cam Rayner, Isaac Rankin, Jade Gresham, is, is it going to take that for them to actually be recognised because it is a fact that it is so much harder to play forward and play consistently than it is as a midfield uh, player, Joey. It's a very good point. I mean, Jordan DeGoe is probably another case in point. As soon as he moved into the midfield, he's now become an absolute bona fide star at Collingwood, led them to the flag last year. So is it more the fact that you think as an industry, we are generally a bit Heart, too harsh on forward. So I was just even thinking oh. as you were talking then, Eric Hipwood copped it two weeks ago um, and then he'd come out and kick goals on the weekend. Do you think we're, we're harsh on forwards, expecting them to perform every single week? And really, yep. the only forwards that do that are probably the all-time greats, let's be fair, where it, most other forwards are going to fluctuate in performance week to week. Well, I mean, even some of the like current greats, like a Jeremy Cameron, who has ga- he has games where he has you know kicks one goal and has less than ten possessions, but he's all of a sudden given the freedom to roam and he rocks up twenty eight yeah. on the weekend. So oh, I th- I think it's just the way we the way we judge them and the expectation on getting the footy as a, as a forward. I mean, it, it is starvation corner. So some weeks players like Cam Rayner and Isaac Heaney when he was forward, you are just starved of opportunity. So uh, I think it's probably just a little lens to be able to apply to those type players, particularly the guys that don't get a lot of footy funneled through them, like the key forwards. Um, these more mid-sized Zach Bailey's of the world that Every time you go to be super critical, just think of what it looks like with Isaac Heaney now in the middle. Because, I mean, he's going to be leading the Brownlow um, and, and all, it, all it took was a, a bit of a run through the middle, Joey. So it just goes to show that dime a dozen midfielders, you know, you can just stick anyone in there. I remember Clint Jones went in there one week. He was banging onto you blokes about how easy he was. He racked up 35 and that was the end of the argument for me. What's, uh, what's your thought of the week? It's a good point, bro. I, I like that point a lot. I think you're spot on there. And the way the team defences are set up too is to defend the back half and defend the forwards, but the midfielders get all the room to roam around. No wonder you were keen to play on the wing the last couple of years of your career when you're slowing down <laughs> as a key forward. Hey, um, oh, no doubt. My thought of the week, um, I went with it on Sunday night in the first crack, and I'll, I'll bring it up again because I, I, off the back of it, and it wasn't necessarily specifically to the Freeman or Carlton ending to that game, but because it was topical, and I'd raised it previously uh, and a couple of years earlier, 
I was asking why we're not open as an industry to having some sort of mechanism to review an umpiring decision, whether it's a captain's challenge or the umpires can challenge it uh, themselves uh, and what the parameters around it. I didn't get into the specifics because it wasn't that sort of that sort of conversation, but it was just to raise it and, and bring it up. And it's amazing off the back of that, how quickly everyone is generally in the industry to shoot down any ideas and straight away go to why things can't work. Oh no, it's going to be manipulated or oh, we don't want to hold up in the game or our game's riddled with mistakes. We just need to accept it. And I sort of think, well, if that was the case, I mean, the answer's about, oh, we, our game's full of mistakes. Well, that's been the way for 140 years we accepted goal umpires' decisions until a grand final was decided by an incorrect goal umpiring decision and we decided to bring in a score rev- a score review or, or things like the, the way the umpire bounces the ball in the centre bounce. For 140 years, whichever way the ball bounced, bad luck. But we decided yep. to, oh, no, that's unfair. Let's bring it and throw it straight up so that it's fair for both Ruckman or, you know, the boundary umpire's decision has been the one that's lasted for forever in a day. But now we get to a situation in first quarters, the two boundary umpires and the field umpire can get together for 30 seconds and waste time discussing who shin it came off to see who gets a free kick on the wing. Mm. But yet when it comes to a critical decision late in the game in front of goal that can decide a contest, we're not open to yeah. the idea of being able to challenge and review that. So, uh, how, just so how I would you do it? Pose. Captain's captain's how, call. Well, if you, if you want, I don't to think bring, it could be. That, that's my view. I don't think it could be a captain's call no, because the captain. You know, okay, the, the name captain's yeah. call doesn't have to specifically be the captain because again, yeah. people are going. A challenge. A challenge. Yep. A challenge. So, so someone, whoever, whoever, whether it's the coach or a player, because they see it and it's definitive. Yeah. Look, I, I don't, I don't mind it. I, I don't. The the NFL will do it right, but yep. the NFL well, sport, did it, and they do it. Yeah, every sport. But the NFL in particular, they started doing it around areas of the game like pass interference where there was a lot of grey because they had a Super Bowl that was decided on a, on a terrible pass interference call. Yep. So they brought in the rule. They then sacked it after a few years because there is so much grey. So uh, a holding the man in a marking contest or a high tackle or a holding the ball decision, I think there's too much grey in those. But for ones that are, are, are clearly definitive, like, you know, was the ball definitely out of bounds? Was the ball definitely touched off the boot before it was marked in the Ford 50? Yeah, look, I think some of those um, where they're howlers and, and then we get them, we then have a stop play situation pretty immediately to be able to review it. Well, then, yeah, I think you could apply it then. But, but you'd hate for it to you know, two minutes of the play to go on and then we go back and review something that happened two minutes ago. I think there are a lot of complexities, but yeah, I, I don't hate the idea of exploring it in the preseason next year and, and see what it brings up. You could even start it with a simple parameter that it's only to be used in the fourth quarter and it's only to be used if it leads to a direct shot at goal. So it can't be sort of yep. used as a tactic up the field or anything like that. But what, and maybe this, the game on the weekend wasn't a big enough game to raise it. But what if in a final, Paddy Cripps gets tackled outside his top of his goal square and he's pinged for holding the ball. He's adamant that he got a fist to it. And the replays clearly show that he got a fist to his handball, but it's pinged. Do you reckon then it might draw a bit of, you know, a bit more attention? But anyway, just a point, but I do want to just throw to Laura Kane on discussing this point. It's not something we're looking at. We're focused on making sure that our technology is as good as it possibly can be for score review, but it's not something that we're looking at extending in term, into the game itself uh, in terms of officiating the game. So maybe not right now, and that's fair enough. I would maybe have liked her to say, but look, we are open to anything that can improve the game mm. and make sure that we get the right results because I'm not sure just sending out a... a a memo yeah. on the Monday saying we got that one wrong is probably going to please people. But it's interesting as technology develops. So that's the yeah, point I think, in case, and as you, uh, you know, you're in this industry, as the yeah, technology one hand's develops, going to wash the other. Yeah. Yeah, one hand's going to wash the other there because in, in order to review properly, you have to have the proper technology, which at the moment we don't even have for goal reviews. That's right. Um, which is a, a separate topic because, gee whiz, there weren't there some absolute oh, shocking that- reviews on the weekend. That, that's um, unbelievable. Right. So there's a mechanism as well in the in the game. We we have organically 30 to 40 seconds after every goal at least to be able to run a quick review to to pick up the howlers. So um, I hope I hope the umpiring department, particularly the goal umpires, get a pretty stiff talking to after the weekend because some of those were disgraceful. 
Yeah, that's right. And maybe that's what's putting everyone off is that at the moment they are not even getting the score reviews right. And I don't even know if they're in this on the same page of what when they can review, what they can review, and some of the ones have been mm. uh, shocking. So you're Clunky. spot on, spot on there. Hey, uh, just some of the other talking points out of the weekend. Really, Cosy Pickett is going to challenge his one match ban for a bump. Uh, tonight at the tribunal, if you were on the leadership panel, in the, you know, a leader at that, the Melbourne Footy Club, what advice would you have to young Cosy Piggott now, who continually sort of gets himself in this situation? Yeah, look, I, I think this is an interesting one, and, and and I don't think all examples are equal because I think there are guys that are undisciplined and malicious, you know, and kind of go out of their way and and, and engage in selfish acts. That, that hurt the team. I don't feel that way about Cosy Pickett. I just think he's one of those guys with the plays with such sort of energy and, and, and spring and explosiveness that he inevitably inevitably finds himself in some of these situations through poor technique. Um, and, and so I, I would be uh, reluctant to dim his explosiveness and, and instinctiveness in the game um, because I think what you would potentially lose out on outweighs, you know, the positive of, of him missing a game. Now, clearly, if he ended up missing a final or something, you'd probably regret it, but um, let the boy play, I think. Yeah, it's a big big game too, Thursday night against the Brisbane Lions at the MCG. Hey, last one before we take a break and get into real talk, shit talk. Again, a lot of noise about Essendon, and it feels like, and I mean... Not that we have any vested interest in the Bombers, but for Essendon fans that have to have lived through this for now almost the best part of 15, 20 years, and they feel like it's the same results year after year, same sort of performances, despite all the different noise we hear out of the preseason. What have you made of Essendon? And I mean, there's a lot of talk about the Essendon edge, and we saw it for you know, a week mm. and maybe at the game against St Kilda, and then it drops away, and a really poor yeah. performance. And it's more the performance. It's okay to lose to Port Adelaide uh, yeah. in Adelaide, but the, the way they lost again, was disappointing. And the frustration is that nothing's really changed. What's your view? Yeah. Yeah, look, I kind of sit on the middle of it a little bit. I don't mind that they went public with sort of putting themselves out there with the Essendon edge because then you create your own accountability tool. Um, The trouble with that is when you don't live up to it, you open yourself up for the criticism. So I thought it was a little bit laughable how over the top everyone went applauding them um, with the edge they showed in the Sydney game. I mean... The tag unsociable hawks that took three or four years um, yeah. for you know people to become aware of and respect, um, and, and Hawthorne earned that. Um, whereas the, the bombers, you know, it was it was it was one week. Anyone can do it for a week. You know, anyone that has a player that gets tagged that gets assaulted by the other team, and you say, yeah, we're going to stand up for him this week. Anyone can go out and do it for a week. And I look, I think the reason they find themselves in this situation, and, and again, I. I don't mind putting yourself out there, but, you, but you've got to live up to it. They're coming from a long way back, um, from my point of view. So, I mean, you, you think about a couple of you know uh, years ago when Dyson Heppel was, was captain, you know, they, they stood solidly behind a, an ethos of you know, laughing, joking, the sort of having fun, the, the smiling, um, and that's okay. But then to flip to the Essendon edge, you know, where tough, we're aggressive, we're ruthless, that's the big shift. And when you don't necessarily have the, the senior players that are, that are comfortable doing that or leading by example, you know, like, like, like Dyson, who's been a, a good player and leader for, for the Bombers, but he's done it a different way. And then, you know, Jake Stringer, who, you know, he's never really been a pro. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a big shift and it's going to take them some time to get there and find that consistency. But the way you get there is one by one, way to numbers. More and more guys just start getting over to the... the uh, the Zach Merritt side of the room where he's uncompromising and, and consistent every week with delivering it. Yeah, it's a good point. I think, I think about Essen's leadership and other than Zach Merritt, I, I, I try and think of who else has got the ability to sort of shift the momentum of a game, to impact it so that when it's not going their way, that they can, they can sort of, you know, have that imprimatur in the, on the contest and, and just wrestle it back. You know, we were lucky we had leaders and the, the strong teams do, but Zach Merritt's been awesome, I think, in that in that category. But maybe not enough others to come with him to be able yeah. to wrestle back the momentum. So something they might need to address. And maybe it is going to be their next batch. Maybe it is going to be the Sam Durhams and the you know the Archie Perkins and some of these guys yep. that, that, they are, that are coming through that can be those type of players. Because at the moment, when things get tough for them, 
they've just struggled. Although against St Kilda game, their first 15 minutes, they were horrible. And they were able to wrestle back momentum on that game. So maybe they do have it in them. They just need to find the consistency. But it certainly is frustrating the Essendon supporters at the moment. Hey, we will take a break. When we come back, we'll take a look at Real Talk Shit Talk. Of course, if you are listening to Footy Talk, make sure you hit us up for a question on Instagram at Footy Talk underscore pod or on TikTok at Footy Talk pod. This is Footy Talk. If you're listening on Spotify, please hit the bell to be notified when we drop a new episode. We're playing Real Talk Shit Talk, where we look at some of the statements that have been made over the weekend and discuss whether we think it's real or full of crap. And I'll start with you, Rui. The AFL needs to suspend Jer- Jeremy Finlayson for his homophobic slur. Uh, well, they might need to, but they can't because they've created the precedent already with uh, what occurred earlier in the season with Alistair Clarkson. So I, th- I think to suspend him, um, whether that's just or not, uh, would would not be equitable or fair given what happened with Alistair Clarkson early in the year. So I would expect a... I would expect a similar a similar fine um, with what was it a two game suspended sentence uh, yep. and a, and, a, and an apology and and I know Jeremy's already been very contrite about the situation so I would expect consistency there from the AFL. Um, Joey Carlton undefeated four and oh first time since ninety five. Take the record out of it. Is the brand sustainable? Is what they're dishing up every week sustainable? 100% real talk, Rui. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. Their clearance game is really poor at the moment, but that's okay. They will get to some sort of equitable level. They, they are a good clearance team. The turnover game, which is modern footy, which is what wins premierships, they are sitting really comfortably near the top of the, uh, the leaderboard in that category, particularly defending turnover, which is the most sustainable. They have now got a really, really sound team defense and structure behind the ball. Their clearance stuff will figure will work out. Uh, their ball movement is improving. This is the real deal for Carlton. I think that if they stay fit and healthy with what they've got, uh, they're, they're, they're a prelim team. And I always base it off getting yeah. to a prelim because, as you know, getting to a prelim is the challenge. And then from there, it's how you play on yeah. the night. They, will, they are good enough and playing the right brand to be in a prelim. Hey, one back at you. We've spoken a lot about gather round, but the AFL must make the Crows and Power play each other in gather round. Or add to that, it's a bit unfair that they get the extra home game on the rest of the competition because of gather round. Yeah, I think that's real. I, I absolutely think it's real. If, if Adelaide and Port Adelaide want to keep it in their in their home city and the, and the city wants to keep it, well, I, I think that's that's a decent enough compromise to be able to retain it. Otherwise, the noise and the and the jungle drums will get louder and louder that this is unfair, um, and it'll 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 get moved to another city. So if you want to keep it, well, then P- Power and Crows play one of your two showdowns during Gather Round. I don't think that's a lot to ask for for what is a pretty good celebration of footy, Joey. Or they sacrifice one other home game and have to play that away later in the year. So they play the, the 11 mm-hmm. or 12 home games, which is fair. Because you're right, Port Adelaide are in the middle of five out of six games at the Adelaide wow. Oval. Just the way that it falls with gather round and a yeah. showdown in there. It's a really good opportunity for Port Adelaide to consolidate themselves in the top yeah, four. Yeah, they look good too. Look good to another power. Uh, you got one for me? Uh, no, you got one more back at no, me. No, I got one for you. Uh, uh, all right, Joey. La- last one, Geelong. They've held this mantle, I think, for a, for a good number of years. Uh, are they still the best forward line in the competition? I tell you what, Rui, that, that might be still real talk. I can't think off the top of my head. Maybe the GWS Giants, but that's probably got more to do with how they're moving ball the ball use. at the moment. Mm. But watching Geelong and the way they connect with their mids and their half forwards and their forward line is still... For me, the benchmark of the competition. I mean, Brian Myers kicking to be able to find his key forwards the way that Brad Close and Mitch Duncan um, hit the hit their targets. The the evolution of Ollie Dempsey and Ollie Henry as emerging forwards. Tyson Stengel still there, and while Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins are still playing and still playing relatively good footy, I still think that's if you're a team or a club looking at okay, how do we want our forward system to look and what does it look like? That's probably the benchmark. So I reckon that's a good call by you, Rue. So that's real talk for me. Hey, hey, that's all we've got time for. I know you've got to get to baseball practice. You happy with that? You good? That's great. Well good. done. Hey, this has Another been good Footy week. Talk. Well done, Rui. If you do want to get involved, make sure you send us a message on Instagram. Tomorrow, we have a rose between two thorns. Abby Holmes joins Nathan Jones and Jack Everett as they will take a look at the week from a player's point of view. Until then, enjoy your Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Thanks for watching Footy Talk. Subscribe to the channel to watch myself and Rui every Tuesday.